Hi everyone, today we're going to talk a little bit about the Catholic Christian understanding of morality. So let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come Holy Spirit, please guide us as we seek to understand the topic of morality. What will lead us to authentic happiness and fulfillment. Pray over everyone in this class. Lift up everybody's needs to you, Lord. And we pause to thank you for all the many beautiful blessings in our lives. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's start by defining what we mean when we mean morality. Often the first thing that comes to people's mind when they hear the word morality is right and wrong. And sometimes also rules, norms that you have to follow. So this is part of morality and we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit, but this misses the boat as far as what morality is at a fundamental level. When we're studying morality, we're studying how to be happy. It's looking at what's the way to live that's going to lead to my full flourishing as a human being. And so norms and laws are a, are a part of that, and we'll see why. But morality is, is much bigger than just laws and norms. And it's really worth looking at this question because happiness is ultimately the reason that we do everything. This was referenced in the Bishop Barron lecture that you watch. He talks about how happiness is the reason ultimately that we get out of bed in the morning, right? We, you, you got out of bed today and you're listening to this lecture because you want to pass this class, because you want to graduate, because you want to get a job, because you want to be able to provide for yourself and maybe a family someday, and you want to provide for yourself and a family someday because you sense that that's related to happiness as a human being, being able to take care of yourself and, and meet your needs and also pursue recreation and things like that. So uh, even the smallest actions like getting out of bed are connected to these questions about what, what way of living is going to lead to my full flourishing, is going to lead to my happiness. And these questions provoke a further question, which is, is there a particular path to happiness, right? Do, do all people have the same path to happiness? Is there a truly right way to live? Do we have a certain human nature that thrives on certain behaviors and doesn't do well when we pursue other behaviors? Is there something objective about morality or is it truly all subjective? This is looping back to the idea of moral relativism that we explored at the beginning of class. So th this question of, is there a right way to live? Are there, there norms and laws that are true for everyone that help guide us along this path to the happiness that we're seeking? Or is it truly just whatever we want person to person? And again, I want to note, as we discussed when we talked about the human person's call to love, when we're saying there's a right way to live, we're, we're not saying there's no variety. So with, within this kind of paradigm that there's a right way to live, we can still have different vocations as we stuck, discussed. Like I'm a parent and a wife and a, a teacher. You may be called to be a nurse or a business person or a lawyer, right? Some of you will have families. Some of you will be single. Some of you may be called to the religious life. So there's room for variety of vocation while still claiming that people have the same end, the same purpose, and there are moral norms and laws that apply to all of us. Those two things can go together. Okay, so when we're, we're looking at is there a particular path to happiness? Is there a right way to live? We're not saying everybody's going to do the exact same thing. We're saying, is there an ultimate end 
that we're all journeying to? And are there specific objective norms, laws that can that apply to everyone that can help us achieve that end? Okay, so and as we're considering this claim, this idea, this question about uh, is there a particular path to happiness, I, I want you to ponder three analogies that I, I think could help illustrate what we're talking about here, what we're trying to get at. So first I want you to think about an arrow, like a bow and arrow. So what is an arrow made for most fundamentally? Hitting a target. What if I decide I want to use this arrow as a drumstick? I want to use it for something else other than what it was made for. I can do that, right? I have the freedom, the capacity to do that. But what will probably happen to the arrow? It will probably break or be damaged in some way. So again, my freedom allows me to use something contrary to the end or purpose for which it is made, but that will probably lead to some sort of damage or lack of fulfillment of the inbuilt purpose, right? If I'm using the arrow as a drumstick, I, that's thwarting the arrow's ability to fulfill its end. It's, it's tell us what it's made for hitting a target. Okay, now I want you to think about a car. What is a car made to run on? Gasoline, we all know that. Or in, in today's world, you now have some options for electric, but no car runs on Kool-Aid, correct? So I can put Kool-Aid in my car. I can say, you know what? In my opinion, cars should be able to run on Kool-Aid. I'm gonna put Kool-Aid in my car. I can do that, but it's not gonna go well. It's gonna cause serious damage to my car. Third analogy. Think about the human body. What's your body made to run on? Well, we do best, we thrive when we eat protein, fruits and vegetables, complex carbohydrates. That's what our bodies are made to run on, those healthy foods. I can decide, you know what? I want to eat Big Macs every day for every single meal. That's what I want to do. In my opinion, that's what my body should run on. And that might taste good or seem good at first, but over time, we know that is going to have detrimental effects to my health. I'm not gonna be a healthy person. I'm not gonna fully flourish if, or, or potentially not flourish at all uh, eventually, right? If my arteries get clogged enough, um, if I'm eating Big Macs for every meal. So why am I talking about all these analogies? So we're asking, this question, is it reasonable to assert there are certain behaviors that will not lead to human flourishing? Like, is there something objective about morality? Is it, are there certain things that are, are wrong because they're, they're genuinely going to thwart our flourishing? And we're gonna look at the argument that yes, it is reasonable to assert that. It's reasonable to say morality is objective there's certain behaviors that harm us, ultimately. That's why there's moral prohibitions against them. And there's certain behaviors that lead us to flourish. And that's why there's norms encouraging or, or pointing us to or requiring us to do those things. So the Christian claim is that there is a way there is a a right way to live for all human beings that leads to our authentic happiness our full flourishing as human beings and that end that that purpose that way of living that humans are made for it's it is love so the christian claim is that we are made for love we are made for love of god in others, that's our end, that's our purpose. When we live in accord with the order of love, and, and we've discussed in this class that love has a nature, it has an order, and it's an order that's received, that's given, that's outside the self, it's something we, we encounter 
it's not created by the self. So again, Christianity claims moral realism, that there's a real standard for all people, that when we act in accord with that standard, we're going to find happiness and flourishing. And when we don't, we won't versus moral relativism. The church rejects moral relativism, the idea that there's there's absolutely no moral code beyond what the individual makes up for himself or herself. OK, so the, the Christian claim is that when we act in accord with the order of love, the, the nature of love uh, that's given, we find authentic flourishing. And again, this is we, we've talked about this in other classes. This isn't claiming that every single person has the same way of living out the call to love. We talked about that when we talked about the human person. We can each have different vocations. So for me, I'm, I'm a wife, I'm a mom, I'm a teacher. For you, you may be called to be a single person in a lawyer or a nurse or a business person, or you may be called to religious life. Right. So there there are different ways of living out the call to love. But at the same time, what the Christian claim is, there's there's certain norms that apply to everyone that help guide us to authentically live out our call to love. That there are certain behaviors, there are certain things that are objectively not loving. And if we do those things, we are not going to flourish. We're ultimately going to hurt ourselves. We're going to hurt our relationship with, with God and other people. And there's other behaviors. When we pursue them, we're going to find authentic love of God, love of neighbor. Okay. So it's saying there's the same norms and there's the same ultimate end. So the ultimate end for everyone is full communion with God and others. We'll talk about that more momentarily. Uh, but the way I reach that is through being wife, mother, teacher. The way you reach that is, is doing something else. But there's norms that guide us all, that keep us all on track, so to speak, to achieving our final goal while we're living out our unique individual vocation. So that's, that's important to understand that. Okay, so again, when we direct ourselves towards something other than authentic love, well, so this is like putting Kool-Aid in the gas tank. When we try to run on something else other than authentic love, we ultimately do damage to ourselves in our relationships with God and others. Okay, so I can have an opinion. You know, I want to run on Kool-Aid. Something else is going to fulfill me. And I have freedom as a human being. I can do that. But the Christian claim is that won't ultimately fulfill me okay then how do we know the the way to attaining this full relationship with god and others is through christ christ both fully reveals what the nature of love is what the order of love is through his life through his teaching and he makes it possible for us to live it out through his death and resurrection he has restored our capacity to achieve our ultimate end to be in right relationship with god and others and even beginning in this life the grace of christ truly allows human beings to overcome sin to overcome concupiscence that tendency to be selfish and authentically love god and others so the the claim is Human beings can truly be rehabilitated, so to speak, through Christ's love to live out the, the call to love in our own lives. That's the claim. The church, as we've discussed, is Christ's concrete continuing presence on earth, the extension of the incarnation in time and space. So the church continues to make Christ's grace present through the sacraments and continues to make his teaching, the, the way of love, present and known through her teaching. So we, we've talked about the magisterium 
that the Holy Spirit works through the magisterium to be a, a living voice, Christ's living presence in the realm of, of teaching to help the faithful know and understand what is authentically good. Okay, so again, the church is that, that mystical body of Christ, his way of continuing to be present on earth through which he continues his saving work through making the grace present through the sacraments and the, his teaching present through revelation. There's three components, scripture, tradition, and the magisterium. So the word Aquinas used, Thomas Aquinas, one of the great theologians of the church, the word he used to describe the ultimate goal of the moral life, a, a goal that all of us share by virtue of being a human being. So like we, we are all created for the same end, that right relationship with God and others. He called this beatitudo, beatitudo, and that's basically Latin for happiness. But what, what it connotes, what it, what it communicates is uh, this isn't just a, a fleeting thing, a momentary pleasure that we're after. We have an infinite desire for unconditioned happiness. Because think about it. Like you think, oh, I really want something good to eat. You go to Five Guys and get a delicious cheeseburger and it's so good. But then that pleasure passes, right? We, we become unsatisfied Again, we, we hunger for something else. So, and Bishop Barron walked through uh, the, that argument that Aquinas makes why no created good can ultimately fulfill our desire for beatitudo and how it's, it's something else, right? It's something deeper and bigger. It's this infinite desire for unconditioned happiness that can only be satisfied which in, by an infinite good which is God. So beatitudo is full communion with God and all others in God. So we've discussed throughout the course, love of God and love of neighbor always go hand in, in hand. And the Christian claim is that, again, this beatitudo can only be achieved through Christ. And I want to pause and, and bring up a question that that often comes up, and I, I think it's it's a great question, this this question of, well, isn't it just enough to be a good person? Why do I need relationship with Christ? Why would I need church? Why would I need worship, right? Isn't, isn't it enough to just be a good person? And the Christian claim is, is that ultimately, no, that's not enough to attain ultimate happiness. And we can start to see the reason why when we understand that the Christian claim is that happiness, and so like the moral life, the pursuit of happiness, is fundamentally about relationship. So if the ultimate goal of the moral life, the ultimate goal of human life, is full relationship with God, I can't have that without relationship with God. And the Christian claim is Christ is who makes possible, the one who makes possible full relationship with God. Through his death and resurrection, he puts the person back into right relationship with God and gives the person the grace to fully live out authentic love of God in others. So if Beatitudo was something else, then then being a good person might might be enough. But if if it's full relationship with God and others, and that is the Christian claim, is that the person can never be fully happy without God, because God is the greatest good and it's 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 what he is who we are made for. That's that's the claim that creation, he made us out of his goodness for relationship with himself, that we cannot attain that good, that ultimate good, that ultimate satisfaction without him. And that doesn't mean that serving others isn't important. It's essential. It's essential. And 
Christ made that really clear. If you read Matthew 25, he says, if you do not feed the poor, right? Feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, shelter the homeless, visit the sick. If we don't do those things, if we don't love our neighbor, we there's no kingdom of heaven for us. That's what he says. It's really explicit because we, we can't claim to love God and not love his children and not love are our brothers and sisters who are made in his image and likeness. The two absolutely go together. So it, it's not saying love of God to the exclusion of being a good person and loving your neighbor, but it's saying we really need both and that it's only through being in relationship with God that we can fully love our neighbor, that we can fully overcome our sin and selfishness and make a pure, complete gift of self for the sake of others, not for what they can do for us like Christ did on the cross. Okay, so the claim is that loving, love of God, love of neighbor, go hand in hand. Both are completely essential. Okay, so this helps us understand what Christianity means by good and evil when we think about good or right acts or evil or wrong acts this this helps us understand what is meant so acts that are good lead us into deeper relationship with god and others so they lead us into deeper relationship with god and others and that makes sense they're loving actions love of god love of others leader it lead us into deeper relationship Acts that are not good, acts that are evil, there's there's an absence of good. These acts are failures to love. So when we fail to love, what ha what happens? It, it breaks down. It hurts the relationship. It distances us from God and others. So wrong actions, evil actions lead us away from Beatitudo, that complete relationship with God and others that our heart desires. Um, and again, talking about that heart's desire, St. Augustine said, our hearts are restless until they rest in you, O Lord. The, the understanding again is that the human person is made for God and in full relationship with him, in relationship with others in him, that, that charity, that full relationship with God and others. Anything else is cooling. Right? Anything else other than authentic love of God and others is ultimately going to be unsatisfying and hurt us, um, even if it doesn't appear to at first, like eating the Big Macs. It may seem good at first, but eventually the bottom is going to fall out. And um, another Quote I wanted to mention to, to wrap us up on this point here, this, this claim that we can only achieve beatitude through Christ. This is what Christ meant when he said, and this is uh, him speaking, recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus is the way. He makes manifest makes known the truth of love so that when we live in accord with that when we're in relationship with christ we can attain abundant life we can attain full flourishing we can attain the attitude oh now i'd like to discuss in greater detail the parts of a moral act so as we discussed on the Last slide, a good action is one that moves us deeper into right relationship with God and others. It's authentically loving. It gets us closer to beatitudo. A bad or evil action is a failure to love. It breaks down relationship with God and others. It moves us away from beatitudo. But now I want to discuss in greater detail what are the components of a moral act that can help us make an assessment make a judgment about whether or not a given action is authentically loving. So there's three parts of a moral act. The moral object, which is what is chosen, what the actor is intending to do. 
the moral end is why the action is chosen and the circumstances are the unique features of a situation. All three need to be good or appropriate for the action to be good. If, if one is bad, if one is problematic, then the action is bad. The action is evil. The action is problematic. Okay, so a classical example to help us sort out which one's which is there's a, a storm at sea, there's a ship, it's about to go under, so the crew throws the ship's goods overboard to save the ship. So the moral object is throwing the ship's goods overboard, what the crew is actually doing. The end is the why, which is to save the ship, and the circumstances are that there was a terrible storm. So all three need to be, be good or, or fitting uh, for the action to be good. So in this case, the, the moral object, there, there's no absolute norm prohibiting throwing a ship's goods into the sea, okay? So we need more information to know if this was a, a, a good action, but it's, it's not intrinsically evil, and we'll talk more about what that means in a moment. To, to save the ship, the reason is good, and the features of the situation, a terrible storm, there's no other option, the, the circumstances are, are fitting, so this would be a good action, okay? But all three need to be good or fitting for the action to be good. In the Catholic Christian understanding of morality, the end does not justify the means. What does that mean? It means you can't do an evil, a bad, moral object for a good reason. Doing evil, breaking down relationship with God and others is always evil. So there's an understanding that you can't try to do evil to achieve good. It's and, and when you think about it, it's oxymoronic. Doing evil to do good, right? It you're still doing evil in that situation. So let's give a few examples. We intuitively understand this, right? We we understand doing the wrong thing for a good reason is still wrong. So stealing to donate to a charity, that's still wrong, okay? Uh, and and we, we understand that not every way of seeking to solve a problem is a good thing. So say that the foster care system is broken. I frequently hear people say that. Well, we would never say, well, to fix that, we should terminate the lives of foster children. So we understand, even if we have a good end, right, ending child abuse in the foster system, there are some means to that end that are good. There are some that are evil. We can't do evil for the for the sake of good. It's still evil, okay? It, it, even if we are doing it to end child abuse, ending the lives of foster children would not be acceptable, right? Ending poverty, that's a good end. We would never say, okay, the way we're going to do that, we're all going to go out tonight, steal as much as we can from a grocery store and give it to the poor. No, we would understand that is not a good means to an end. For it to be a good action, we need good means and a good end. Okay? Um, so doing the wrong thing for a good reason is still wrong. Doing a good thing for a bad reason is still wrong. So, for example, if I donate to charity to bribe a politician to do something unethical, that is wrong. Okay? Also, doing a good thing for a good reason in problematic circumstances, that is still wrong. So, say I'm going to the store to buy food for my family. That's a good thing. Um right? Good object, going to the store, good end to buy food. But say I do it leaving my baby at home by himself. That would be a bad action. That I would be being a negligent parent, even though I was doing a good thing for a good reason. If the circumstances aren't appropriate, then it can still be, and it is still, a bad action. Okay, so again, to, to sum up what we're getting at here, it, there's this maxim, the end does not justify the means. To truly be doing good, we have to have a good object, a good end, and fitting circumstances. 
So to choose evil, acting against the good, even for a good purpose, it's still turning away from and damaging our relationship with God, who is the good itself and others, right? So when we act against the good, we're always ultimately acting against God and others, undermining the, the purpose that we're setting out to achieve, authentic love of God in others. Okay. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about moral laws. Let's start with a broad definition of law. A law is a dictate of practical reason emanating from a ruler who governs a community. So the word I wanna hone in on here is reason. Law should not be a dictate of will. What's the difference between a dictate of reason and a dictate of will? Well, a dictate of will would say, I want you to do, and I'm gonna impose on you a law making you do what I want you to do just because I want you to do it. Okay, it's an imposition of will on another person, um, regardless of whether or not that is good for the other person. So that is not the Christian understanding of the function of a law. A good law should be reasonable. There should be a reason for it. And that reason should be that it helps the person, the individual in the community attain the good for the community. Okay, so laws in the Christian understanding should be reasonable. And why, why is this so important? Well, it helps us understand the, the function of moral laws. In our culture today, frequently, moral laws are often seen as restrictions on freedom and happiness, where it's like, well, I really want to do something else, but I guess I'll, I'll follow the law because I have to, right? God has imposed his will on me. I guess I'll do it. Or some people say, hey, the heck with the moral law because I don't want to have someone else's will imposed on me. I want to do what I want to do, and what I think is going to make me uh, most happy, most free. So I don't want the moral law at all. But both of these frameworks are misunderstandings of the Christian vision of moral norms, which is the opposite. The understanding of moral norms in Christianity is that they show us what good, authentically beautiful, loving behavior that will lead us to true freedom and true happiness. Moral norms show us what that looks like. They show us in so many words how to love, how to achieve the attitude of that full communion with God and others that we're really seeking. Okay, so they are reasonable. They're in accord with the reason of the universe, the order of the universe, the nature of of love that we've said the christian claim is when you act in accord with that nature you'll be happy you'll be fulfilled ultimately and when you don't you won't okay so how can we know the law how can we know the the reason built into reality well in a couple ways one is through the natural law what the natural law is is the human person's participation in the eternal law so the eternal law is God's reason. That's the order that's intrinsic, that's written into, that's built into reality. Okay, so the natural law is the part of the eternal law, the part of God's reason that we can know through our reason. And so we talked about this uh, quite a bit the first week of class. We, we can know certain things are self-evident to our reason like that stealing is wrong, that killing an innocent person is wrong, right? That lying is wrong, that cheating is wrong. We can reason to an understanding of that. And that's why those moral codes, those moral prohibitions, uh, we, we see them across time and space, across cultures, uh, across the centuries. We see a lot of agreement in different cultures on those uh, those moral, moral prohibitions, okay? So the natural law is one way we can know what's good. We can know how to authentically love God in others. 
Um, another way is through revelation. As we discussed, to have a complete understanding of reality, we need both faith and reason. So through scripture, tradition, and the magisterium, the three components of revelation that we discussed earlier in the semester, we can come to know what is authentically good. We can come to know moral laws that help point us to good and beautiful behavior. And I just want to give one example of this. This kind of ties together the natural law and revelation. I want to give the example of the Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments show that the path or, or the beginning of a path towards right relationship with God in others. Okay. So the first three are focused on God. So to be in right relationship with God, you can't have other gods, false idols. You can't use God's name in vain. You have to honor the Sabbath. And the second seven commandments show us how to be in right relationship with others. You can't lie. You can't cheat. You can't steal. You can't kill. You should honor your parents, right? You, sh you shouldn't be jealous of others. Why? Because all those things break down relationship with others. So those norms, they don't inhibit our freedom. They don't restrict our freedom. Those norms point the way to authentic freedom because freedom is ordered to the good. We're given freedom by God. The Christian understanding is we're given freedom by God in order to choose the good, in order to choose him, right relationship with him, right relationship with others. So we're most free when we're most able to choose what's good. So laws help us be more free because they point us, they make clear the path to the good. Just a couple other notes on moral law. I wanted to talk about what an absolute norm is. An absolute norm is a norm that's true in every circumstance. So some norms are absolute. Some of them we just mentioned, like you can't kill innocent people on purpose. You can't steal, uh, deprive others of their rightfully owned property on purpose. Okay. So there's some norms that are absolute. Those are moral objects. You, you can't uh, choose them and be choosing good. No moral end justifies uh, the, the violation of an absolute norm. Okay, so those are ones that doesn't depend on the end and the circumstances. The, the object in and of itself is a problem when, when an absolute norm prohibiting something is involved. And like I said, kind of the quintessential example of that is not taking the life of an innocent person. Other norms are, are not absolute. It does depend on the circumstance to assess whether or not an action is, is truly good or not. I also wanted to revisit the concept of culpability. We talked about this a little bit when we talked about sin and sin is a failure to love. And we talked about for something to truly be a sin, it has to be a wrong action. So the, by uh, the standards we just discussed, object, end and circumstances. So it has to actually be wrong. You have to know it's wrong and you have to do it anyway. So there are cases where someone might violate a moral law. They might fail to love. They might reject the good. But if they didn't know that what they were doing was wrong or they uh, were pressured, they were under duress, they might not be blameworthy or as blameworthy for the action, they might have less culpability, but that doesn't mean the law in and of itself is, is not true, that it doesn't hold. It, it does hold. It does point us to the fact that a given person's action was objectively wrong, but subjectively, they might be more or less blameworthy depending on the amount of knowledge and the amount of freedom they had in making that choice. Next, we're going to discuss virtue. So let's start again with the definition of virtue is a habitual and firm disposition to do the good. So the opposite of virtue would be a vice, a habitual and firm disposition to do evil. Okay, so but focusing on virtues, these are essentially 
love skills, the habits of goodness that we need to be in right relationship with God and others. So examples of virtues are like humility and generosity and kindness. Okay. So in the Catholic Christian understanding, there's this idea that law is not enough. We also need virtue because we could know the law, but if we haven't formed our will to, to desire and be able to choose what's good, the law isn't going to be fully helpful to us. So virtue is the skill. So think about sports, okay? Think about tennis as a sport that I like. So I could know all the rules of tennis but be really bad at tennis. Why? Because you have to learn how to play the game. You have to develop skills. I have to learn how to hit forehands and backhands and serve and come to the net and know when to do that and all those different things. So the skill, that's like the virtue. So I need both. I need to know the rules and I need to have the habits, the skills the, to play the game. And you can think about any sport is like that basketball, Baseball, you both need to know the rules and seek to follow them, but also have the skills to actually play the game. Okay, so virtues are like the skills that help us uh, help us love, right? Play play the game of life, where the goal in this uh, paradigm that we're looking at is love of God and others. Okay, so we need both law to point us to, to show us, okay, this is what good behavior is. And we need the virtue, that the habits, the skills to actually live that out, that we need both. They go together. And how do we build virtue? By doing good actions, right? One good action begets another good action. You know, at first it can feel hard to be good. Say you're kind of a selfish person. You don't have that virtue of generosity. Well, at first, you know, you might want to be generous, but you feel like you can't do it. And then eventually it's like, okay, I, I can overcome that through willpower and God's grace combined. I can start doing generous actions. And then the more you do generous actions, the more you get in the habit of doing generous actions. Before you know it, you become generous. You're not only able, but you actually want and are disposed to do more generous actions. So virtue also too, it helps us see how all our actions are connected. And it shows us how with morality, it's not just about doing good, like in the sense that it's outside of us, we're, we're doing, we're producing good in the world. Our actions also have an effect on us. They affect what kind of person that I'm becoming. So when I choose a good action, it has an effect on the world that's good, but it also has an effect on me. It helps me become a good person who's more likely to do another good action in the future. And, and again, the, the same is true with evil. When I do evil once, I'm more likely to do it again in the future. It has an effect on the world, but also an effect on me, it makes me a vicious, right, a vice-filled person when I repeatedly choose evil acts. Okay, so uh, there are four what are known as cardinal virtues. They are prudence, temperance, justice, and fortitude. Cardinal means hinge, and the reason these are, are upheld as the four cardinal, cardinal virtues is regarding worldly, interworldly behaviors uh, all other virtues flow in some way from these four. So prudence is known as the mother or charioteer of all the virtues. It's the ability to see what's good. And you can see this is essential. If we can't see the good in a situation, we can't choose it. Temperance is the ability to desire and enjoy worldly pleasures well. So things like food and video games and entertainment and sex would all be under the realm of temperance. Um, then justice is giving others their due and fortitude is courage. So these four in regard to inner worldly 
behaviors are the basis for all, all the other virtues. Then there's three what are known as theological virtues, and they're theological virtues because they're oriented directly towards God. So faith is essentially believing well. Hope is desiring uh, well, desiring uh, things, uh, heavenly things, supernatural things well. And charity, we've discussed this at length, is that capacity to fully love God and others. So faith is about believing, hope is desiring, right? Full communion with God and others. And charity is actually living, experiencing that full communion with God and others. And it's only through God's grace that we can live these realities out. Faith, hope, and charity are gifts from God. So as we said, law needs virtue and also virtue needs law because it helps us uh, see what's good. Sin can cloud our judgment. So moral norms give us clarity regarding what is truly good and what is evil. And again, then virtue is that skill of being able to live out the good. Lastly, I'd like to say a word about conscience. So what is our conscience? It's our human capacity to know right and wrong. So our, our conscience is what allows us to exercise that virtue of prudence we just spoke of, that ability to see, to know the good in a given situation. So our, our conscience enables us to live the good life, the, the moral life, the happy life, because it helps us. It's our capacity to discern, to see through the use of reason and revelation, what is truly right, what is truly wrong. So uh, there's an understanding in Catholic Christian theology. Some people are surprised by this, that the church says you should always follow your conscience. Okay, you should always follow your conscience, but there's a very important caveat. We also have a duty to form our consciences. So there's an understanding that our, our conscience, our capacity to know right and wrong can become obscured. It can be obscured by sin. It can be obscured by our formation. If we grow up in an environment, say, for example, that's abusive, you might grow up thinking abuse is okay when it's not okay. Or it could be an environment where your parents or your peers consistently teach you that certain things that are wrong are, are right. And that could affect your ability to discern right and wrong on your own. So our, our consciences can be malformed by different different things um but they can be reformed they can be formed properly um to truly be in tune with what is good and true and beautiful and that can happen in a variety of ways through the influence of our family and friends through reading and studying and uh, through relationship with Christ and the church. And in the Catholic Christian understanding that that last component, relationship with Christ uh, through the church, that is the most fundamental. So while we should always uh, follow our consciences it, uh, in this, in the Catholic Christian understanding, there's also the understanding like your, your conscience would never um uh, tell you to, to do something that directly violates the teaching, the clear teaching of Christ. So there, there is a high likelihood, right, if we are um, thinking, coming to the conclusion that something is right that's in clear contradiction of the teaching of Christ, the understanding would be our, our conscience has been malformed for, for some reason and we need to seek to form it in accord with Christ through relationship with him that is facilitated by the church and her teaching and sacraments that are Christ's continuing presence on earth. So 
I hope that this presentation helped to shed light on some of the key aspects of the Catholic Christian understanding of uh, morality. And if you are interested in this topic, I encourage you to go deeper by uh, pursuing, I, I teach another course on morality. Um, if you'd like to know more, we can dive deeper there. But hopefully this gave you enough to give you a, a basic understanding of things like the purpose of of life. Uh, the goal of the, the moral life is, is happiness, is beatitudo, which is found in right relationship with God and others, why Christ is essential for attaining beatitudo, uh, what purpose the moral law plays and virtue plays in attaining beatitudo, and what role our conscience plays in helping us attain it as well.